Oh, okay. Thanks, uh, Alejandro. So welcome, uh, Brian. And uh, uh, you are uh, an associate professor at the University of uh, at Albany. And uh, as far as I know, this is uh, in the New York's capital region. Um, and uh, you are working in the field of uh, climate dynamics and climate modeling. So we have something in common. Even so, I, when I look at your uh, bio, it's really more on the dynamics part, which is very interesting. And uh, today, uh, I mean, you are very passionate about open science and uh, open source software. And today you will uh, present us uh, the PCR project and explain how we can uh, uh, make some open science uh, and open Jupyter book. I think this is what you will do. Thanks, uh, uh, Brian. The floor is yours. Thank you and for, the, for the introduction. Um, yeah, it's fun to be here. Uh, so I, I'm going to share my screen here and do a couple of things. Let me make sure I share the right screen. And let's go to my slides. OK. All right, so you should be seeing my slide that says Project Pythia. OK, so. Um, I have I have a set of slides that are probably a little too formal for the small group that's here right now. So I'll probably go very quickly through some of them and spend more time on some live demonstrations. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about this project that I've been involved in for a few years. Um, project Pythia is um, has some funding from the National Science Foundation in the USA to um, develop a kind of community learning resource specifically for the geosciences to um, to help the geosciences community more effectively make use of the large stack of tools in the Python language um, that are allowing us to to do a lot of interesting open science. So some big challenges around um, the power of the tools um, and the the speed with which the open source tool chain is evolving versus the ability of the average scientist to kind of stay on top of, of knowing how to use the tools effectively. And that's what Project Pythia is um, supposed to be um, trying to, to address. So I'm going to give a brief overview of what the project is and what we've been able to do. Excuse me one moment while I reshuffle some windows. OK. So. Um, well, the main motivation, as I've sort of said, is that is that geoscientists need um, these uh, Python based open source tools and cloud based data sets to do the best science they can do. Um, but many of us don't have the skills necessarily to know how to make use of the tools and there's a lack of training material that's specifically focused on the needs of working geoscientists. Um, so this is just a kind of cute graph illustrating in the world of, of Python, this idea of, of, of a stack of, of dependencies. So at the core, at the base of this pyramid is the language itself and um, a number of packages that are kind of everyday working tools for a lot of scientists who use Python that do things like manipulate data and make visualizations. But on top of that, there are, you know, other, there, there are more specialized packages depending on um, the specific domain one is working with in and the types of data one is working with. Um, there's a, a sort of bewildering array of, 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 of packages that need to be um, kept track of. And this basic question for someone who's new to this um, uh, set of tools, which package should I use to get my, my work done is kind of a, a, a more complicated starting point than we want it to be. Okay. Um, so Project Pythia was launched um, about three years ago in an attempt to be a community-owned resource to be a sort of the place to go if you are working in geosciences and you're using Python and want some guidance on where to get started um, on uh, and um, how to find you know good quality working examples of of code that actually you know touches the kinds of data sets that you want to work with with the kinds of tools you need. Um, 
the name Pythia, I should just mention, it's it's it, it comes from ancient Greek mythology. It's kind of a cutesy reference to the fact that the it was the name of the oracle of Delphi, um, uh, with this sort of reference to the Python, which is the monster that the god Apollo is said to have slain, you know, in 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 prehistoric times. Um, and so so Project Pythia is meant to be some sort of oracle to help you with your Python problems. Let's put it that way. So um, I have some slides going over some of the resources that we've been able to build, but I, I actually think I, I'll just flip through these slides um, and then go straight to a live demo. So we have um, a book called Foundations that I'm going to show you, and this is kind of the starting point for anyone who's new to Python and new to using this whole stack of, of packages. We have a gallery, I will show you this, that lets you um, uh, and essentially you know, find a curated list of, of useful references that are out there online um, and that's, that's searchable in, in what we hope is useful ways. Um, and then cookbooks, which I'll have a lot to say about, are, are kind of um, the, the leading edge of our project right now, where we're trying to um, trying to catalyze a community collection of, of more advanced tutorials and example workflows that build on top of the lessons in our foundations book. And I'm going to say this again at the end, but I just want to make a plug right now um, for this uh, hackathon that we're calling a cook-off that we're, we're running um, just over a month from now, um, which is intended to really grow this collection of, of content in the cookbook. So I'll, I'll circle back to that. Let me go, let me turn off my slides and actually just go um, to my web browser here. And let's start here. Okay, so this is the Project Pythia homepage. So um, there's a whole bunch of links that I already dropped into the shared document um, that are also at the end of these slides. But um, this is the homepage for our project where you can hopefully fairly easily find all the things that I'm going to refer to. So from here, I'm just going to go on this top nav bar to foundations um, and spend a little bit of time showing you this book, which um, is one of the key resources that the project has been able to build. So um, this is meant to be a kind of comprehensive getting started guide for people who don't have a lot of experience um, with Python code and are a little bewildered about how to do things like install the software they need, choose the packages that are um, that are appropriate for the analysis tasks that they may be looking at, um, and, and then serve as from there as a as a durable reference um, on top of which more advanced tutorials can be built. And that will be in the cookbooks that I'll show you in a little bit later. So this is broken up into two main sections. Foundational skills include things like um, how to get how to install Python on your computer. So we go into some detail in this section here about things like managing um, package environments on your own machine with with Conda, for example, which is an environment um, management tool. Um, the things that appear in these lists are basically the Pythia team's assessment of what, what are really the tools that you need you know, to, to work in this domain. What, what are the kind of essential pieces? So we've kind of, um, before we get into the details of specific Python packages, we have this foundational skills section that talks about Python itself and installing the environments that you might need. Talks about, in the next section, Jupyter, um, how to work with Jupyter Lab, how to, how to understand what a Jupyter notebook is, um, and how to work with the, the document format. And then a, a fairly extensive section here on GitHub, which is really the, the um, platform that we use to host all our content as well as uh, collaborate on developing new content. And I'm actually going to show you a live demonstration of doing some GitHub enabled um, cookbook work in, in a moment. But this series of tutorials is really meant for the working scientist who um, is vaguely aware that there's this thing called GitHub and there's this thing called version control with 
with software called Git, but doesn't really know with the bewildering array of different learning resources out there where to get started. So this is um, this is sort of what we've come up with as the essential tutorials that you need to be able to do things like collaborate on some content that you might want to contribute to a cookbook, for example. Um, following this section, there's uh, a, a list of what we consider the core Python packages for doing um, geoscience analysis. Um, so if you worked in Python, a lot of these names will be familiar, but there are lessons under each of these headings on the basic use of a, a number of these, you know, everyday tools. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize here is when you go into one of these lessons and you, um, you know, you can read through this as a static page, um, but you may want to actually run this code and interact with it as part of your learning process. And there is a lot of instructions embedded here in the book on how to do that. Um, but there's essentially two different ways you can take this code and run it. One is to just literally clone the, the source material, set up a Python environment on your own machine, and have access to all these notebooks and do whatever you'd like with them. Um, the other way to interact with this material, the more point and click way, is through this uh, binder link. And normally at this point, I would give you a live demonstration on clicking this link and launching into this same notebook in a live interactive computational environment. Um, I'm going to have to defer on that because we're. it, it seems we're a little bit between um, resources at the moment, and none of the binder services that we've been using are actually working today. I checked this morning and found, okay, nothing's working. Um, the Pythia infrastructure team is actually in the middle of launching a, a new binder service that has better capabilities to support our cookbooks, and we're going to have that in place in time for our uh, hackathon that's coming up uh, a month from now. But um, we're sort of in an in-between, so I'm going to leave that be for the for now. Um, so that's the foundations book. There's a lot of material here, and again, we intend this to be, you know, a a a, a, a sort of beginning to end kind of uh, full orientation on all the tools that that you need to get started in this in this world. I'm going to show you a couple other things while I'm here in the web browser. So if I go to this resources tab. I'm now in what we call our resource gallery, and this is um, this is just a, a long list of curated links to um, stuff that's online that um, is relevant to our audience, which is again working geoscientists who want to use Python to do their science. And you can see various tags on these entries. And if I scroll back up to the top, this is filterable, so I can do things like. Um, I want to find all the resources in this gallery that are related to MetPy. Okay, MetPy is a package for meteorological analysis. Um, there, I filtered this gallery. Each one of these cards here is a link to some resource. This happens to be a link to the actual documentation of the MetPy project. I can filter um, rather than by package, I can filter by things like, well, what science domain am I interested in? Glaciology. There's not a lot at the moment in this gallery with that tag. Um, if I filter by a more popular tag, let's say I'll get a bunch more resources. Okay, so um, the other thing you'll see here is a button saying submit a new resource. This is kind of crowdsourced. If you know of something that you find useful in your own work that you think belongs in this gallery, it probably does. And we would love it if you click this button, which will bring you to a form on GitHub that will let you um, submit the link with some tags um, to add that resource to this gallery. So this gallery gets better over time. The last thing I'm going to show you here is this cookbooks gallery. Okay, the gallery itself looks very similar to what we were just looking at, but um, this is now uh, a view of our collection of what we call cookbooks. And cookbooks, I'll go to this one here, the radar cookbook. Um, cookbooks are 
collections of content that um, build on top of the foundations book to teach more specialized skills or give um, working examples of how to do a particular kind of analysis with some publicly available data set. This particular cookbook called the Radar Cookbook is one of our most highly developed at this point. And you can see the structure of this book, much like the foundations book itself, is kind of split into two parts. The first half is basics. It's, it's lessons on, on how to use some tools. And the, the second half is more working examples, right? So if I click through to one of these, first of all, I'll see some links back to what are the explicit prerequisites if I'm going to consume this notebook and understand it. What do I need to know? A lot of these are links back to chapters of the foundation's book. And that's one of the ways we're structuring the cookbooks is to have, have these uh, explicit sort of web of links back to prerequisites so that someone who stumbles on this material and get a sense of what do they need to know in order to understand what's in here and make use of it. Um, but this particular example goes through some radar data from a particular um, particular event and does some analysis. I don't know if anyone here is a radar meteorologist. I'm not a radar meteorologist, so I won't talk much about the content. Um, the other distinguishing feature of the cookbooks is the automation that does health checking and i'm gonna i'm gonna show you a little bit about how that works but if i go back to this gallery i see these badges nightly build passing failing passing everything in this gallery is is being tested regularly and that's a distinguishing feature of the cookbooks um to, to address what we think of as the notebook obsolescence problem and i anyone who is works with Jupyter Notebooks and has experience finding one out in the wild on the internet um, is probably well aware of the fact that most of the code that you find out there um, either is just broken or it's not clear what environment it actually needs in order to execute. The cookbooks are not just collections of notebooks. They're collections of notebooks with a very completely described computational environment. And every notebook in this collection is actually running regularly in an automated way to make sure it's still running and flag things that are not running so that maintainers have a chance to go in and fix them. So we're trying to build a collection here, not just of stuff that worked somewhere at some time for somebody, but stuff that actually works for people when they need it. And they can click through to an environment and actually run the code, access the data, and not just immediately be stymied by broken links, um, out of date code, um, because the packages that the code relies on may have been updated and broken some things. Yeah. So the health checking is a really essential part of what we're trying to do with this cookbook project. All right, with that, I feel like I ought to stop and just ask what questions people have. But the second thing I wanted to do with my time was actually show you in real time um, the process of actually building a cookbook and putting it online, okay? because there's some nice automation in place. The cookbook infrastructure is, we're trying to build something that makes it as easy as we can for someone who has science domain knowledge and may have a notebook that does something useful and wants to share it with the world. That's what the cookbooks are really all about. And so I wanna kind of give a real-time view of what that might look like. So I, I hope that's um, interesting for this audience. Um, I might actually stop my share temporarily here. Whoops. And um, given that it's a small group here, I, I think um, I might, before I launch into my live demo uh, of building a cookbook, maybe just pause for questions. Is that okay? I know we're well, maybe that um, gets in the way of the plan to stop the recording for the Q and A. So yeah, I think we can cut also the recording, so that's no problem uh, if people want to ask question right now. Hopefully, yeah. So I'm going to share screen again. Okay. 
Okay. So the demo I want to show you. So I have this notebook. Okay. I want to demonstrate this use case here where I have a notebook that does something I feel is useful and it's sitting on my own computer and I want to share it with the world. Um, and, and specifically, the useful thing that this notebook does is driven by some publicly available data. And so in principle, this code should be able to run anywhere. Um, but I have a notebook sitting on my laptop, the same laptop I'm using to give this Zoom talk. Um, and the data that this notebook touches is actually um, on the Google Cloud and it's output from the CMIP6 climate model experiment. And so um, I don't have time to go through all the details of the code in this notebook, but I will actually run it and I'll, I'll say a couple things about it. So I'm going to I'm going to clear this notebook and show you, first of all, this runs here on my laptop in real time. Um, I'm going to import some packages and I am going to be reading. Um, I'm going to be reading this uh, this database file that is on Google Cloud that has you know uh, points to this very large collection of CMIP6 output. So I've read it into a pandas data frame here. So touching a bunch of commonly used Python packages, I'm going to query this data frame with some keywords, and the specific keywords here are going to zero in on uh, model output from the so-called historical experiments. Um, and um, atmospheric model output. Um, and so in this query, I've got 635 rows. So I'm just seeing a fraction of that here. Um, so this is just a lot of different model runs that have been done by modeling centers and, and exist within this, this cloud store database. Um, in this example, I'm gonna filter for stuff produced by NCAR. So here now is a more manageable list of model runs that are all tagged with the institution ID NCAR. And now I'm gonna zero in on one data set. I'm gonna take actually, this just says the very last row in this uh, in the previous store. And I'm gonna run this through um, uh, some data wrangling code here to um, open this data set that I found in that store as an X-Array object. So X-Array is, is labeled gridded arrays. And so uh, I now have in memory the handles to one particular data set that has TAS as surface air temperature. That's kind of a controlled vocabulary in, in the world of, of CMIP. So I've loaded um, surface air temperature from one simulation of the historical period done by the group at NCAR with the CESM2 model. Um, so, uh, and this is all happening in real time here. I can do things like uh, select one particular time slice with a date, 1950. I can make a quick and dirty plot. Um, this is obviously not a great map because it's missing some things we might like, but it, it's enough to see what I'm looking at, which is um, air temperature on a Kelvin scale. We can certainly see where the continents are on this map. What I want to do is make a time series of um, surface air temperature in this simulation over the whole simulation. I want to do global means. So I have to weight this, this, this uh, grid by the cosine of latitude to take the global mean. So I wrote a little function that does just that using X-ray language here, which gives these very nice abstractions for these kind of labeled data operations. So there's a reusable function I've just defined. I want to see it in degrees Celsius. So I'm subtracting 273 degrees from the value. So I'm I'm plugging, if I plug that one time slice into my function, I get one number, right? It's 12 and a half degrees Celsius. That is the global average surface air temperature at year 1950 uh, on this particular date in this simulation, right? But I can just as easily pass the, the whole data set through that global average function, and that's going to give me a time series. This is actually a quick demo of so-called lazy execution. So here I've just kind of set up the, that averaging operation. The calculation hasn't actually happened. So this is using a tool called Dask under the hood to um, 
to do the parallelization of, of large uh, computations. This dot load in the next graph here in the next cell is actually going to force um, my laptop here to actually do the calculation. It's pretty quick in this case. It only took, uh, you know, 414 milliseconds. Um, but I get from that this time series that I can then plot, and that's the last cell in this graph. Great. So I made my nice graph, which gives me this time series of global mean surface air temperature in this one simulation taken out of CMIP6. And I was able to do all this in real time from that publicly available cloud stored data. So that's cool. Um, and what I'm going to do is just save this notebook here. But I'm going to, so the goal, the goal of, so that was just a walkthrough of what this notebook is, but I haven't shared it with the world and put it in a place where it's subject to the, the reproducibility infrastructure of the cookbooks. So I want to take this same code and I want to share it online, but also have it be executed in a controlled computational environment online so that this code doesn't just you know, make a note, make this graph once, but gives people the ability to keep running it and adapt it for other needs. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to clear away all the output that I just generated. Okay, I'm going to save this notebook. So there's nothing in it. And I'm doing this so that you can believe me when I say the entire calculation is going to be redone um, online when I drop it into a cookbook. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see in real time if I can show you what it looks like to actually create a brand new cookbook. So I'm going to go to um, I'm going to let's see I'm going to go to Project Pythia GitHub organization. So I'm now in GitHub which is where all of the Project Pythia resources live. And I'm going to go to this repository called Cookbook Template. And this is the repository that uh, makes it as easy as we can at the moment to do what I'm trying to show you, which is take a notebook and turn it into a reproducible cookbook. So I'm going to make a brand new repository here by using this template. I'm going to create a new repository. And I'm going to create it in my own personal GitHub space. And I'm going to pull up my own notes to make sure I do what I'm supposed to be doing here. And I'm going to call this CMIP demo cookbook. Okay. Well, I'll give it a little description here, a brief demo of creating the new cookbook. I'm going to click this checkbox here, include all branches. That's actually going to, um, well, never mind for now. Oh, you can ask me later why I had to check that. I'm going to create this repository. Wait for GitHub to do its work here. I have a new, new repository that is pre-populated with a bunch of stuff that came from that template. OK. Now, what I want to do is drop in the notebook that we were looking at that is currently sitting on my laptop and have it get rendered and published as a nice looking book, sort of like the other cookbooks that I already walked you through. There's a, just a couple steps I have to go through here. Um, first is just a little bit of annoying infrastructure, GitHub stuff. I have to go into settings for my new repository. Go to the Actions tab. And by the way, this is all documented in our Contributors Guide. Um, I have to go scroll down here. Nope. Sorry, I have to go to this General tab, and I have to find these permissions. I have to let the GitHub workflows, the automation that drives the cookbooks, permission to write to the repository because it's going to need to do that for the publishing stage. So I have to save that before the demo is going to work. All right, that's it as far as cryptic, weird GitHub manipulation. 
in this repository, there's a folder called notebooks in there at the moment. There's just a template that just comes with with this note with this cookbook template that just kind of shows the structure of a typical Pythia notebook. That's not very important right now. I'm actually going to just drag and drop. You can't see the part of my screen where I have. Well, let me move it over here. Okay, here you can see it. Here on my laptop, I've got this notebook called mycmipnotebook.ipynb. That was the one that I just ran us through locally. I'm just going to take it, I'm going to drag and drop. There's a lot of ways I can interact with a GitHub repository, but this is one of them. I just dropped the notebook right in. So it's there now in this, um, no, it's not there. What happened? Let me try that again. Oh, I had, I had to click the commit button. Okay, we're going to add this notebook. Here we go. So there it is, my CMIP notebook. So it's all ready to, um, to run through the build system and turn into a nice looking web page. I have a couple steps I have to address here first. Okay, one is defining the computational environment. So here in this in this repository, there's an environment.yaml file. This is where the packages that are needed to actually run the code are specified. There's some stuff in here from the template, but I'm going to directly edit here and I'm going to add a few things that that this CMIP notebook actually needs. I'm going to add matplotlib. And this information is going to be used during the automated build to set up the right environment. XRA, pandas, we take ESM as one of the tools we use to query the, the, the CMIP6 database. FS spec is another piece of that chain. The Google Cloud um, system needs this specific Python package. And then we happen to need this NC time access package to handle the time information in the data set we're working with. Okay. So as the person who developed the, the notebook locally and you know wrote the Python code that's in the notebook, I know kind of what packages I used there. I just need to make sure they're fully specified here in this document. So I'm going to commit those changes. They're there now in the repository. Now I'm just going to do some more cosmetic things. So I'm going to go into this config file, um, which tells, uh, you know, the, the cookbook uses a tool called Jupyter Book to do its work. Um, Jupyter Book takes notebooks and puts them together into nice looking web pages. I'm going to just um, go into this configuration file here and update things like the title. So I'm going to call this quick. Whoops, I need to start editing this file here. And I don't have to do this editing right here on GitHub, but for this demo, this is all I need. I could also obviously clone the repository down to my computer and use a proper text editor to do all of this. But um, I don't actually need to to get this working. So I'm going to call that quick cookbook demo. I'll put my name as the author. Um, I'll, why not? I'll update my email. That's all I'm going to do here. So I'll commit those changes. And then I'm going to go to this toc.yaml file. This is the table of contents for my Jupyter book. And if I want the notebook that I added to actually show up in the book that we're going to build, I need to add it to the table of contents here. So it was notebooks slash my CMIP notebook dot. I don't have to write dot ipynb because the Jupyter book infrastructure knows um, what types of files to look for. That's all I have to write. 
I'm going to commit that. And one more cosmetic thing, I'm going to go to the readme file here, which also is going to serve as a title page for the book that we're going to build. So I'm going to put a title here, the same title, quick CMIP, what did I call it? Quick CMIP demo cookbook. Let me commit that. The book is now building in the background. Okay, I've I've set in motion a bunch of machinery. Uh, I, as the scientific author here, don't really need to understand much about how the machinery works. Um, for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to click through to this actions tab. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of actions running because I made a bunch of uh, different commits to this repository, and every time I make a new commit. Um, the build is going to rerun. Um, the latest one is the one we're most interested in. It's actually running right now. Again, um, I, as the scientist, don't really need to understand the nuances of the GitHub Actions system, but this is a view into what GitHub Actions is doing. So it's at the moment, it's on the step where it's it's constructing the execution environment that we need. So this is using information we put into that environment file to set up a computational environment. This is often the most time consuming step if the code in the notebook is not particularly heavy. Um, it's done now. Uh, no, it's still running. This is sometimes a bit like watching paint dry. But for the purpose of the demo, we'll just keep watching the paint dry and I'll say a few things. So what's going to happen after this is um, the the uh, Jupyter book build will occur. And it's during that phase that the, the notebook is actually executed within this environment that we're building. So the same thing that I showed you on my laptop is going to happen in the cloud on GitHub Actions. And that is going to leave an artifact behind, which is some web pages that contain those rendered notebooks. And there's a next step that'll happen after that, which is the key part of our publishing pipeline here, which is that artifact is then going to be actually routed through to another GitHub service called GitHub Pages. And it's actually going to appear as a web page. Um, and I won't have to do anything. Hopefully this is just going to work. And you'll you'll see at the end of the day here that I've actually succeeded in publishing my reproducible work in a place everyone can find it. Okay, so the execution happened. Um, the execution um, happened up here. I hope. Let's see what we got out of this. The next stage in this set of actions is a deployment. Um, where we're sending this to GitHub Pages, that's done. And then GitHub Pages has to do its work of putting things in a, in a publicly visible space that's still running. So again, I don't really need to be staring at the paint drying here, but just to give you some insight into what's going on. Um, GitHub is still working on building this and deploying it, and we're almost done. Deployed, and it gave me a link here. So let me open this link. So I've made a web page. OK, the URL of this page, um, because I created this in my personal GitHub space, it's brianrose.github.io slash the name of my project. Uh, which is CMIP Demo Cookbook. And I've got this beautiful looking Jupyter book here, which one of the tabs here is our CMIP 6 example notebook. Now, did it run? Well, there's my output. Okay. So I can breathe a sigh of relief because it worked. Okay. You, you saw that I 
checked in an unexecuted notebook into the repository. But the end product of this build system is a, a, a web page with the rendered executed notebook. If I go back to the repository, just to emphasize that that's actually true, into the notebooks here, and I look at the source notebook that's in the code repository, it's empty, right? The, the output is not living in version control here. Um, so we, we're we trying, with an emphasis on reproducibility here, trying to um, let the build system do the work. And one of the things that we get with the cookbook infrastructure is not just a one-time build, but again, a, a scheduled build um, with alerts when things break so that I, as the content author, with help from the Project Pythia infrastructure people um, can fix things that break and keep things healthy as everything marches forward. So that is the end of my quick demo on how to build a cookbook. I'm just going to toggle back to my slides for one moment here just to wrap things up. Um, so there are a bunch of slides I didn't show. We'll try to make sure they're um, shared somewhere after the fact. Um, the cook cookbook system is meant to be this complete pipeline for reproducible self-publishing notebooks, resting on a bunch of technologies, including the Jupyter stack, including uh, binder services, including a lot of things that GitHub provides, like the action service and the pages service where we're publishing um, the, the output. Um, and so what I try to emphasize here is that if you, as the scientists, have this cool workflow that you want to share with the world and want to put it under this system of reproducible testing, we're trying to build tools that make that as painless as they can be. And um, so this let's set of bullets here is basically what I just showed you. There's an additional set of steps if you want to turn your content into a cookbook that's actually hosted on our gallery that involves basically, you know, moving the repository into the Project Pythia organization and filling out some tags for how to get things labeled on the gallery so it's findable. I won't go into that for now. Um, I just want to wrap up with, I want to make sure I get this slide on the screen at some point. Um, a lot of people involved, right? There's a core team of people who, many of whom receive some funding from the NSF grant that we have, but even some of these people don't, but they're very active um, in building everything that I just demoed. And then many other people who have made contributions over the years that this project um, has been ongoing. I tried to put as many names as I could find from all of our different GitHub repositories. I'm sure I forgot some, and I apologize for that. Other people have contributed things that don't show up in the repositories, just in the form of conversations and ideas. So this is an open community. I want to make sure I plug our hackathon one more time. So if you go, and again, links are in the shared document. If you go to Pythia Cook Cookoff website, you'll find info about this in-person and online hybrid event that we're running whose intent is to grow that collection of cookbooks by get, gathering people who have some cool content they'd like to share with people who understand how all these build systems and infrastructure work and really in, a, in an intensive hackathon environment, really push forward the cookbook collection. And with that, um, I will stop my share and see if there's any time left for more questions. Yeah, we have some time left for questions and thanks a lot because it was uh, really interesting and